Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm very grateful to see you all. Um, yeah, I'm a genius and a saint. And uh, yes, it's nice being the National Teacher of the Year and being made a member of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth and all these wonderful things that have happened to me. But I want to make clear that the only thing of which I'm proud is that after 28 years, I'm still a classroom teacher at Hobart Elementary School in Los Angeles. I'm a public school teacher. I met with my kids a couple of weeks ago, even though we don't meet till September. The kids came in over the summer. And uh, it's going to be another tough group, and that's fine. But I actually do this for a living. I always start an evening with a very dangerous story that you should never tell a group of people that you're trying to interest. But here goes. Several years ago, um, I won an award called the Use Your Life Award from Oprah Winfrey. And what I didn't know at the time is that when Oprah is considering you for an award, she hires a private investigator to follow you. Because people lie to Oprah. They scam her. They make up stories so that they can sell their books or sell the rights to the movie or whatever. And I have 1,000 visitors a year visit my classroom from all over the world. So one day I was teaching math, and a very nice young man came in. And I thought it was a teacher. And I said, hey, can I help you, sir? And he said, no, Rafe. I'm not one of your teacher friends. I'm a private investigator, and I've been following you for the last month which scared the heck out of me, wow. And he said, I work for Oprah Winfrey and I have never ever talked to anybody I've tailed. I just file a report, but she heard you were doing a good job in the classroom and she was considering giving an award and I wanted to talk to you. And it's kind of a good news, bad news thing. He said, the good news, you have, without question, the greatest group of kids I've ever watched. It's ridiculous. He said, if the world were like your class, there'd be no more wars, there'd be no more problems. It's amazing. The good news is you are about to win $100,000 for your class from Oprah Winfrey, and you're going to be one of her angel network. He said, the bad news, I got to tell you, man, you are the most boring man I have ever followed in my life. <laughs> he said, you don't do anything. He said, you go to work for 10 or 12 hours a day. You go home to your wife and kids. I've staked out your house. You never leave the place. You don't go out for a beer. You don't have any parking tickets. You are boring, man. He said, you got to get a life. So I wanted to apologize to all of you in advance. You're going to spend a few minutes with the most boring man you'll ever hear, and I'm, I apologize. The other apology is that I am a very straight shooter. During Q&A today, please ask me anything. I will probably offend some of you tonight. You can't keep everybody happy. If I do offend you, please remember that Socrates was the best teacher who ever lived, and they killed him, you know? So, <laughs> I think our best teachers sometimes ask challenging questions and raise difficult issues. So let me tell you just a little bit about Hobart. I teach at a public school in Los Angeles, a real public school. We are not a magnet school. We are not a charter school. We are not a private school. We are a neighborhood school. All the kids live within four or five blocks of the school. 92% of the children are below the poverty level. No child at the school speaks English as a first language. And here is the statistic that just kills me. Only 32% of the kids at my elementary school finish high school. 32% finish the 12th grade. 68% don't even make it that far. Which means that we either have the stupidest kids on the planet, or our system is failing. And everybody here tonight knows the answer to that question. We have failed these children, because I'm telling you, I'm there. We have really capable kids there. Kids absolutely could be one of you, and they're not getting there. And I have spent the last quarter of a century trying to figure out why that is. After getting some recognition for what I do, about three years ago, I wrote a book called Teach Like Your Hair's on Fire. I thought I was writing a little cookbook for teachers, just to give a couple of little ideas of what you could do in your classroom. Instead, it became an international bestseller. I had no idea this was going to happen. And I received thousands of letters from all over the world. But there was an interesting pattern to these letters. First of all, more than half of them were from parents, not just teachers. And the interesting thing was whether I got the letters from Moscow, which I did, or Beijing, or Rio de Janeiro, or Atlanta, it was really all the same letter. And the question was this, Rafe. I want to raise a good kid. How can I raise an honorable kid when he is surrounded by dishonor? How can I raise a decent kid when everywhere in the world 
All they see is indecency, and not only indecency, indecency which is often celebrated and glorified by the American media. How can I, I'm swimming upstream here. How can I get my kid to be more like the kids in your class? And that's why I wrote Lighting Their Fires. It's by far the most important thing I've ever written. It's the best book I've ever written. It's the most subtle book I've ever written. For those of you who don't know, it takes place in one night at a Dodger game between the Dodgers and the St. Louis Cardinals. Didn't use the Braves, I'm sorry, I could have. Chose the Cardinals because of something very funny that happened. I do take kids to baseball games all the time. And I really thought that at this baseball game, a child sees everything that's right about America and everything that's wrong about America. And what I'm trying to do is encourage parents to change the conversation we're having with children. Because in schools, may I ask how many teachers we have here tonight? Thank you for being here. It's not our fault, but everything has become the test. Everything. You are your test score. We have to get ready for the test. The test is coming up. We, we completely base a child on that test, and it's wrong. Okay, it's just wrong, and somebody has to start speaking up about this. I want my children to do well on tests. I always assess my children, but it's only the beginning. It's not the end of their education. So here's a statistic I want you to consider. Of this year's freshman college class in America, if you look at all the freshmen, now these are the kids that made it. They're the winners. They're the ones who passed the tests, who finished school, who wrote their papers. Only 24% will finish college. How could that be? 76% of our best students don't finish? I am suggesting because we have forgotten to teach them the things that really matter, really matter not simply to memorize and regurgitate a bunch of facts on a multiple choice test. That has no measure of their intelligence. It's only measuring how well they can take a test. The real things that get a kid through, through life, the ability to make good decisions, the ability to focus, the ability to manage their time, to work with others, these are not being taught in our schools, and sadly, sometimes it's not being discussed at the kitchen table. Lighting Their Fires divides the book into nine innings. And in each inning, I talk about a skill which I feel is essential for a child to be successful. And then I show the books that I read with children, the activities that I do with children, to get them thinking about this skill. Now, one very important thing about Lighting Their Fires, and I'm very proud of this, excuse me. It is hot up here. Nothing magical happens at the end of the book. The kids do not get out of the car at the end and say, thank you for saving my life, Rafe. I was an ordinary child when this evening began, but after one night of a baseball game, I'm a new kid. I'm ready to, it doesn't work that way. It works that way in the Hollywood movies. I want to remind everybody that this is a long journey. Now our president was in town today, and I love our president, but he's got his race to the top I would like to tell President Obama, it's not a race. What are we in a hurry for? This takes a long time to be good at anything, to be a gardener or an architect or a poet or a baseball player. It takes years and years of diligent practice and joyous practice. And I want to give you an example of the bad and the good. I'm asking children and your children to internalize a set of values that so hardwire them that they don't need you anymore. My students don't care about me. They never look to me for approval. They look to themselves for approval. They judge themselves. They don't wait for me. They're very independent. And I'll show you both sides. Here's the horror story. Do we all want our kids to read? Yes. Reading, essential, very important. One of my former students just told me this horror story. He's in high school, great kid. 10th grader in an honors English class. Great. And to make it better, his teacher had a wonderful idea. The 10th grade class was going to read To Kill a Mockingbird. Great, great book. So what the teacher did was he gave all 40 children a copy of To Kill a Mockingbird and told them all, go home and read it. We'll have tests on it every three or four days. Jason told me 
that two of the kids actually read the book. 38 of the kids, and this is an honors class, got the notes online, looked at the summaries, cut out fake essays and pasted them to their papers, and yes, they all passed the test. But do they know To Kill a Mockingbird? Have they actually learned the lessons from that book? I would say no. These kids have completely forgotten why they're in school. So for all the teachers here tonight, let me tell you a lesson that you can pass on to your children that's really effective. If you see a kid in school who's doing an assignment, a math assignment, spelling assignment, and you go up to him and say, why are you doing this? What will most kids say? I have to, the teacher told me. Sometimes they say, I don't know. <laughs> or there's a test on Friday. You know, my mother will kill me if I don't. Here's the answer my students are taught to say. When you ask a kid who's a Hobart Shakespearean, why are you doing this? He will answer, if I learn this skill, my life just got better. That's the answer. We want to make school relevant. You're not here for this test. You're certainly not here for me. You're here because I'm going to teach you things that you're going to be using for the rest of your life. When we go to the baseball game, we score the baseball game in my class. And my little ones compute batting averages, earned run averages, slugging percentages. They understand the math of baseball. The team set their defense based on the percentages of what the other teams have done against them through all the past history. That math is not simply a question in a book. It's something that's applied to real life situations. And remember the kids who didn't really read To Kill a Mockingbird? I'd like to read a letter to you because my students' words are much more important than mine. Here's an incredible letter, and stick with me, from a boy called Rudy. If anybody should be a failure, it's Rudy. Rudy was not dealt a good deck of cards, let me tell you. He was one of seven children. Four of them were severely educably handicapped. Both his parents had serious substance abuse problems. And the year before he got to my class, his parents divorced, and each of them remarried other people with substance abuse problems. When Rudy came to my class as a fifth grader, he was living in four different apartments a week. One parent, another parent, a crazy grandmother, and a loving neighbor. He would come to my class filthy, in rags. Well, yeah, you know, he's 10 years old. Well, today Rudy is at NYU. And I want to tell you a letter that he wrote to me because I stay in touch with a lot of my former students. And for those of you who don't know this, NYU has a great school, but terrible financial aid. Really tough to get financial aid. And Rudy's friends told me, Ray, he's having money problems. So I'm not a rich guy, I'm a teacher, but I went to my checkbook and I took the last few hundred books, bucks I had and I sent them to Rudy to try and help him out. And Rudy sent me the check back. And he sent me this letter. And I want to show you what he said. He starts off by talking about our relationship, which you, would bore you. But here's what he said that I think will interest you. Rafe, as far as the money goes, I cannot ask of you to give of yourself like that. As I said, I can do it on my own. I just need to work a little harder and cut down on my expenses. I would feel terrible knowing the energy that could be devoted to getting a kid started on the path you got me on would be wasted on me when I can manage just fine. I appreciate your willingness to help me. It reminds me, as if I ever could forget, that you're one of the most generous people I've ever had the honor to meet. But I'd much rather have the money you are offering me go to the class so that one day, maybe some other kid will be in a position like mine. And while I'm on that subject, I have to tell you, Rafe, I tell our story to anyone who will listen. Rafe, I honestly believe that I would be dead right now if it wasn't for you. I was headed down a dark path where drug dealing didn't seem so bad, and the acceptance of a gang was looking like the only way to be accepted. You saved me from that. And now I'm at a top university studying an art that I would never have tried had you not cast me in a play. You showed me a better life, a better way to live. When I tell people about the class in you, I have found myself comparing what you did for me to Plato's allegory of the cave. 
I knew only pain and disappointment and thought that was the way of the world until I met you. I thank God I did. Well, first of all, I had to look up Plato's allegory of the cave. <laughs> I didn't know it, okay? But more importantly, here's a kid who is reading and applying what he reads to his life. This is not a test where he's filling out a multiple choice. What did Plato say? He understands what reading is really supposed to be. Now think of his selflessness. At a time of desperate need, he still is thinking of others. Well, one of the innings in my book talks about how we get kids to be selfless. Think about his independence. I can do this on my own. That's another inning of the book. So the things that I taught him in the fifth grade continue to be a part of his life. And it's much more important than the test at the end of the year. So that's what I'm trying to get across to folks. Now, I want to talk to two groups of people. Do we have parents here tonight of young children? I am begging you in this book to do two things. Two. One thing that's happening, many great young parents, they're terrific, read with their children when they're young. But when their kids start school, they stop. They think, hey, my kid's in school, they're doing their reading. But often they're not. Schools are often forced to read the most horrible basal text with your children that destroy the love of reading. I urge all parents to read every night with their children. I have four children and read with them through high school. We had book clubs all the time. We shared books all the time. If you're on the couch watching television and telling your child to read, that's a mixed message. So my class and my students read every day, all the time, with me. The day of saying, this is a great book, go read it, it's over. There are too many distractions. There are too many people pulling at your child. We have to spend time showing them the beauty of John Steinbeck or James Baldwin or Charles Dickens. We have to be there. The second thing, one of the innings in my book is about focus. We all hear about kids not paying attention anymore. The reason my kids can pay attention for three hours at a time is because all of my students play music. I urge every parent here who has a child, have them play music from the age of five. If I'm the Secretary of Education in this country, music is not an elective. It is a required course of study every year, every day. If you think about it, when a child plays music, they're learning about things that have nothing to do with music. They're learning about concentration, listening to other people so they know when to play. They're learning about the discipline of practice at home, where they have to set time aside because their bandmates are waiting for them to be ready tomorrow. They're learning about making mistakes and then correcting those mistakes. They're learning about pieces that are too hard for them to play. And with practice, they learn they can play. Now that's a pretty good set of skills for a kid to be carrying in his backpack for the rest of his life. All Hobart Shakespeareans play music. Some of my students, after a year with me, play up to seven instruments. Many of them are music majors in college now. And by the way, they're real happy kids. The other thing I wanted to talk to parents about, do we have parents of high schoolers here? Here's what I'm asking in this book to you to talk to your kids about. Number one, please throw out the magazines that say these are America's best colleges. They don't know your kid. Who's to say that Princeton is the best college? Maybe for a kid in California, Fresno State is the best college. And yet we buy into this. These kids who are under so much pressure believe that if they don't go to Harvard, they have somehow failed. They haven't. Some of our Ivy League people wind up in prison for white collar crime. Clearly, they're not successful people. So let's make sure our kids understand that there are many colleges, and you'll hear a letter in a few minutes, that you've never even heard of where kids can be wildly happy and successful. Nothing wrong with going to Harvard or Yale, but there's nothing wrong with going to unknown schools also if that's the best fit. The other inning that I want to talk to parents about are any of you looking for schools, looking at different possibilities for your children, magnet schools, charter schools, private schools. I'm for all of them. But the one thing I want to urge you, some of these schools are very clever at presenting a wonderful image because they're financed by powerful people 
who make movies about them, or have media consultants that make these schools look wonderful, and they're not that wonderful. I've seen them. I saw a school that people rave about. And when the cameras were turned off, I really saw this, children were placed outside in a freezing rain for 30 minutes because their lines weren't straight enough. This is not where I want my child to go. I've seen schools where children who don't do their homework have miscreants hung around their neck. And I've seen Newsweek magazine praise these schools. I think that's a mistake. I want to make sure all the parents here know that there is a difference between a tough school and a school that humiliates children. There was a story in my book about a dedicated teacher who thought that the kids were watching too much television, and I think we all feel that sometimes. So he went to a child's house and took their television away. He carried it out of the house. And people applaud and say, that's great. It's not great. That's not teaching. It's bullying. What a good teacher and parent does is we teach our children to turn off their own television. That's when kids take ownership of their own life. I just spent 12 days at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival with 25 children, just my wife and myself, no chaperones, not needed with this class, kids 11, 12, and 13. There was no rule about television, but nobody watched. They were too busy playing baseball, or swimming, or going to the theater, or playing frisbee golf, or playing chess. They're busy. When kids understand what's available to them, they won't turn on the television. We have to show them that there are better things to do. The line that we use in my class, we don't play video baseball. We play baseball. We don't play Guitar Hero. We play the guitar. So some things that I hope you'll think about. And keeping in mind, this is a long journey. Have these conversations with your children often, often. When we're at the baseball game, for example, one of the funniest moments in the book, Albert Pujols hits a home run against the Dodgers, and four guys behind me start yelling, and I'll clean up the language, F you, F you, screaming at Pujols. F your wife, screaming. And I turned around and said, hey guys, do you see I got a bunch of little kids with me? Can we tone it down a little bit? And they start yelling at me, well, F you too. F you. This is the world our kids are growing up in. But I also wanted the kids to see, I didn't say it back. I turned around and watched the game. It's not that I want to shield the kids from the world. I want them to see there are people who don't behave that way. There are people who come to baseball games on time and watch the game. They don't play with beach balls. They're not on their cell phone. They pay attention to the game. It's a different way of looking at the world. Now, when I planned this little talk, I wanted to have this killer closing. And I thought I came up with it, because I have this letter that I wanted to read to you. But three days before this tour, a second letter arrived that is so ridiculous that you have to hear both. And if you'll trust me, the payoff is really worth it. So I have this question for all of you. Parents, teachers, have you ever had a day where you're thinking, I'm not making a difference? I'm failing. Would anybody like to say that that's? OK. This is for all of us. Before I start, are there any teachers here who have been teaching for less than two years? Oh, great. Could I talk to her for just one minute? Can, you, can we have this conversation? What's your name? Liz. Nice to meet you. Thank you for joining the profession. I'd like to give you a personal piece of advice. Are you ready? If you haven't figured this out already, you're going to have bad days. <laughs> you're going to have some really bad days. You're going to have days where you do everything right, and you still have a bad day. And you go home, you might even cry. I don't know if it's ever happened. You ever cry? I have. And you start to think that law school may have been a better option, you know? <laughs> and then, you put on the latest Hollywood movie about teachers, and the teacher saves everybody. And they all pass the test, and they all win the big game, and you feel horrible, because that's not you. I'd like to remind you, it's a Hollywood movie. Now, I've been at this 28 years, and I'm, I won't lie to you, 
I'm pretty good at what I do. And I fail every day. I have bad days all the time because this is a really hard job. To teach kids to be honorable in this world is nearly impossible. When you have your bad days, I want you to remember, look, I met Rafe and he has bad days, so I think it's okay if I have a bad day. Go home, go dancing, be with your friends, your husband, your sweetheart, whatever. Turn it off for an evening and go in the next day and try it again. But don't you ever give up on yourself because you do make a difference and I'll prove it to you. The first of two letters is a child I hadn't heard from, are you ready? In 22 years, 22 years, this boy and I did not have a remarkable relationship. He didn't hug me at the end of the year. He didn't write me a card that I changed his life. We never held hands and sang kumbaya together. Nothing like that. To tell you the truth, I hadn't thought about him in a long time. And I get this letter. I want you to remember his name, and there's a reason for that. His name is Osvaldo Lopez. Listen to what Osvaldo has to say for those of you who think you don't make a difference. Mr. Esquith, when I was first a teacher, the kids called me Mr. Esquith. Now they call me Rafe, but Osvaldo hasn't seen me in 22 years, so he didn't know that. Mr. Esquith, my name is Osvaldo Lopez. I grew up in the Koreatown section of Los Angeles. Like many of the kids in the neighborhood, I was raised by a single mother who had no choice but to rely on the Los Angeles Unified School District's free meal program and food stamps to keep her children from starving. I realize it's more than 20 years since I've seen you, but if you don't mind, I'd like to tell you a bit about me and what I've done since I last sat in your classroom. I'm not sure you'll remember me, but I've attached my picture in case you don't. So here goes. This is ridiculous. After graduating Hobart, I, like most of my fellow classmates, entered Barendo Junior High. After a year there, I transferred to Parkman Junior High in Woodland Hills. The next year, I started at Taft High School, where I graduated four years later in 1993. In my senior year of high school, I had no desire to, to attend college, and I did not take the SAT. Over the summer after graduation, I changed my mind and enrolled in Los Angeles City College, LACC, with the goal of becoming a lawyer one day. Altogether, I spent about three years at LACC constantly changing majors, political science, journalism, and English, to name a few, and not even knowing if I would ever have the discipline to transfer to a university and obtain a four-year degree. Just prior to enrolling in yet another year at LACC, I decided instead to join the US Marine Corps. There, I worked as an aviation electronics technician and briefly as a clerk in a military legal office. I ultimately served five years and attained the rank of sergeant before my discharge in February of 2002. I eventually managed to complete my undergraduate education, a BS in criminal justice, at Park University a small college in Missouri, while still on active duty with the Marine Corps. Because the school is affiliated with the military, I was able to take satellite classes, mostly at night, at the Marine Air Base in North Carolina, where I was stationed. In the middle of all that, I also attended East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina, for two semesters. In the fall of 2003, I finally made it into law school. I attended the Thomas Cooley Law School in Lansing, Michigan, from where I graduated with honors and served as an associate and senior editor of the school's law review. In my final semester, I landed the internship of my dreams at the Mecklenburg County Public Defender's Office in Charlotte, North Carolina. After my internship, law school graduation, and bar exam passage, not too bad, the Mecklenburg County Office hired me as a public defender full-time in April of 2006. About four months later, with the office's blessings, I left to become a staff attorney with the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces in Washington, D.C., and it is there I have remained for the last three years. Anyway, the main reason I'm writing is simply to thank you for all the wonderful things you've taught me and continue to teach all your students, of which I am proud to be one. 
Please accept my donation of $500 to the Hobart Shakespeareans. I submitted it to your awesome website. Well, yeah, this is the letter every teacher wants to get, right? It gets better. But listen to what we've talked about. Not one name college. A long, long journey. But his persistence, his eye on the prize, started with the seeds I planted. And he obviously feels that way in the fifth grade. So I thought, what a great way to end a talk. And then right before the tour, you can't make this up. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen in 28 years of teaching. And I'm giving it to you, so here it goes. If you got Kleenex, you're going to need it. Dear Mr. Esquith, I've been meaning to write you for a few years now and finally decided that this summer would be the time to thank you for your influence on my life. Without it, I'd probably just be a dissatisfied journalist focused on writing eye-catching headlines instead of the hopeful teacher focused on helping her students writing their own path in their new country. I read There Are No Shortcuts in the summer of 2004, just after I'd been admitted to journalism school and two years into my undergraduate education. I had wanted to be a teacher when I was in high school, but I noticed, get this, that the best teachers at my school were often the most frustrated with the administration, with the lack of public school support, and with constantly changing state standards. Sound familiar? So I picked my favorite subjects, journalism and psychology, and decided to major in those instead. But when I read your book, I realized I'd been wrong. Yes, the battle was frustrating, but that the only chance for many kids is to have people who really cared fighting on their behalf as parents and teachers. Well, it was too late to change my major without adding another two years to college, so I graduated from journalism school and joined the Peace Corps after college. I was sent to a village in the Ukraine where I taught English for two years before I moved back to Washington, D.C., enrolling in a Master of Education program, focusing on English for speakers of other languages. This year, I finished my first year teaching at an American public school, Two of them, actually, because only part-time ESL positions were available in the district paying for my program. And I split my time between the two high schools and have been attending graduate school courses at night. I still feel that I have a lot to learn. Your books have inspired me with both practical and philosophical ideas, and your first book literally changed my life. I can't thank you enough, but I hope you'll accept my donation to the Hobart Shakespeareans for your students. But there's a twist to the story. Last August, I went to a Spanish conversational meetup to brush up my language skills before starting the school year with my mostly Spanish-speaking students. I met a man there who was a native speaker from Los Angeles, and we fell in love long after. He asked me why I decided to become a teacher, and I mentioned you. He told me you were his sixth grade teacher in 1986. His name is Osvaldo Lopez. <laughs> And he's one of the most amazing people I've ever met. Thank you again, and I wish you a great year with your students. <laughs> so, if you don't think you're making a difference, hell, we're putting love in the world. This is a good thing. So, you know, remember, I'm the ordinary guy, the boring guy. If we keep planting the seeds, you don't know what's going to happen. Right, how do I satisfy people? First of all, my strategy, doesn't have to be yours, I do play the game. I get the kids ready for the test, but I do tell the kids when my bosses aren't around that if they don't do well, what does it really mean? Nothing. The sun's still gonna come up tomorrow, their mother still loves them, I still love them. When you do bad on a test, what does it really mean? It means I have to show you how to do it again. That's all it means. And because my kids relax, they do very well on the tests. Because they do well, it allows me to step outside the box and do some of my wilder things, like the Shakespeare plays we do in the rock and roll band. Because I've played their game, I don't fight with my bosses. I see great teachers at my school having knocked down drag outs. I understand it, I just don't think it helps the children. So I will tell you a funny story. I have a friend back here named Robert, and he was, we were talking about um, one of my patrons, Bill Graham. I didn't tell you that one of my patrons once spent 12 hours a day with me five days of the week just to see the life of a public school teacher. And he told me at the end of the week, Rafe, I now know your greatest accomplishment. It's not that you're the world's best teacher. It's that in 25 years, you haven't killed somebody yet. 
He said, how do you walk around here with a pleasant demeanor? And I say, because my students are watching, and I want them to understand to stay calm. But of course it's ridiculous. Of course it's ridiculous. What do I think of merit pay? I'm absolutely in favor of it, but not based on test scores. Test scores are ridiculous. I had a boy this year who was one of the toughest kids I've ever worked with. He missed 60 days of school in the fourth grade. His mother is a prostitute, and he told me, when I once offered him lunch money, he said, oh, you don't give me lunch money. I never have money because my sister's a slut and she spends it all on the drugs. This kid beat people up every day. Well, after a year in my class, he came to school every day. He never fought with anybody. Kids in the class said, boy, he's really, he's a different kid. He's fun to be with on the playground. But his scores were still low. He's way behind. So by the race to the top, I guess I failed. But I would suggest I didn't fail. He had the best year of his life. So until we can have a team of people going into classrooms, understanding the test scores, sure. But how about the kids' behavior, their citizenship, the way they work with other people, their attendance, the way they give back to the school? Yeah, I'm in favor of merit pay, but not on test scores because there's too much cheating on those tests anyway. They're not accurate. If anybody doesn't know that, standardized tests are not standardized. It's all, it's all a sham. That's my opinion. So who does peer review? I would say a collection of all of them. One of the reasons I'm proud of winning the American Teacher Award, I was selected by the other teachers. Okay, that's what makes me proud. No, of course, everybody, and especially, by the way, the parents. We work for the parents. Sometimes schools forget that. They think they work for us. We work for them. It's a service job. But I do think it should be a collection of people. And will the system be perfect? Of course not. But in all jobs of life, people are evaluated. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be evaluated also. How do I read? A, well, basically, when I have kids, and I have kids of every grade level, in terms of I have kids who are ready to read Tale of Two Cities without my help, and I have kids that would have trouble with green eggs and ham, we're reading in a, let's back up to the culture of the room. Nobody laughs at each other in my room, nobody. At the be I have found, it's been my experience, that most kids who are behind in reading are behind either because of a bad home situation, poor teaching before me. I have found very few kids in my experience who just are just not good, who just aren't smart enough to be readers. I rarely find that. What happens is at the beginning of the year, like the first book we read in my class every year is a great book called The Westing Game. It's a wonderful Newbery book. It's a children's murder mystery. It's a lot of fun. I want to remind the kids that reading is fun, but I'd say half of my class at the beginning of the year is too afraid to read because they've had past experiences where kids laugh at them or teachers scold them. So I read a paragraph and I'd say, who'd like to read this? And some of the kids read. And then there comes that wonderful moment where kids make mistakes and I show them how without ever raising, I never raise my voice. And these frightened kids start to realize, oh, I get it. Rafe really doesn't yell at us ever, and the kids don't laugh at me. At the beginning of the year, I must read 90% of the book out loud. By the end of the read, I'm about 5% of the book out loud because the kids are all got, got their hands up. I also want to point out, since you're a third year teacher, you don't have to be reading this high stuff that I read like Huck Finn. The important thing is to read books that they love. Let's remember that reading is supposed to be fun. We've taken the fun out of it. So if you're reading James and the Giant Peach or Charlotte's Web, those books are just as great to read as Hamlet. The important thing, we want kids groaning when you close the book. Time to stop, oh, can't we read one more? And I am forever dangling carrots in front of them. What's she gonna do? I wonder if there's a murder. We're gonna have to find out tomorrow. Oh my God! You know, and then the kids are like, can we read ahead? Of course you can read ahead. I never understood why teachers, no, you can't, of course you can read ahead. Don't, don't tell the other kids. But that's a good problem when the kids are begging to read ahead. So just remember, don't worry about the fact, remember, I've done this for a long time. So you don't have to go out and read tough stuff, fun stuff. And you're going to have some books that don't work. You thought they'd work, they don't work. Try another book. With your style, certain books are going to work for you. John Steinbeck works really well for me. A book that I loved, that I tried for years to get the click, was Treasure Island. It never worked for me. And I tried everything, dressed up as pirates, had treasure hunts. I've seen teachers do it right. It doesn't work for me. I tossed it. I have other books with kids that work for me. Be an individual. Find the books that work for you. 
Don't let the system take away you. Much worse, much worse. The kids that I get, I just, had, I just met 24 kids, sir, who are gonna be my new class, okay? These are fifth graders. 20 of them did not know their address and phone number. How is that possible? They've been living here their whole life. They're 10 years, they don't know their address and phone number. No, it's definitely getting harder. But young teacher, the beauty is, I've gotten better. So it's kind of a mix. The longer you teach, you learn to deal with it. But I think all this accountability, I don't think it's help, helping us at all. Does anybody think it's doing better for us? I don't. I really don't. But if I give up and quit, what does that say to the children? That's my point. I told kids for 28 years, this place matters. If I leave, I'm a liar. I can't do that. I actually have students in college who write to me that they're very glad I'm still there. It means something to them, that there's this stable force in their life that they can come back and say hi to me. I know it sounds crazy, but kids need stability in this mixed up muddle of shook up world. Thank you for bringing some stability to mine tonight, and I gotta go. Thank you, everybody.